What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network. And today I have something new and I think very important and very interesting to you. Because, of course, there are many different sources where you can get your invaluable knowledge. And, of course, YouTube and podcasts and all this is one reason. And, of course, Twitter is another phenomenal source. But I think one of the most amazing high-volume, low-noise sources is the Bitcoin Dev mailing list. So I think I'm just going to do a, well, n not straight up reading, but like a, a reading and discussion, so to say, uh, of these different things coming up. Uh, and I started this entire thing because there was here a great phenomenal email uh, by Anthony Towns uh, on the Schnorr and Taproot upgrade. That is actually a, a well, well, well uh, December. Uh, so so quite, uh, quite a couple uh, days old already, but it really is phenomenal. And it, and it puts out a, a great yeah, summary of all the things that might be coming uh, with the Segregated Witness version 1 update. Uh, so we're just going to jump in the reading here uh, and follow this up. Uh, uh, maybe a, a bit before, you, you might be wondering, well, but don't we already have Segregated Witness? And that is, of course, right. Uh, we fought a war to get Segregated Witness into the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, however, the beautiful thing with SegWit is is that it is very easily, up, or well, quote unquote, very easily upgradable. Uh, we got version zero into the protocol uh, back in August 2017. Uh, however, what AJ Towns, Anthony Towns here is talking about in this mail is how we can uh, get or, or what might be included in the version one of SegWit. Uh, so more about that here a, a bit later. Uh, but we are jumping now right here into the email. Hi all. All the following is heavily informed by talking with other smart people. And while probably all the clever ideas are theirs, any nonsense and mistakes are certainly my own. I guess I'll pretend there were uh, uh, Chatham house rules or something to avoid any blame and responsibility accidentally landing on their shoulders. Anyhow, I hope discussing this in public turns out more useful and productive than disastrous and bike shabby. <laughs> well, and I think that's a nice introduction because, I mean, seriously, the Bitcoin developers are endlessly humble and especially Andrew Towns. I mean, he's done a lot for Bitcoin and he's worked on some beautiful pieces of software. Uh, and of course, his write-up is very, very good. Uh, so... Don't sell yourself yourself short, Anthony. You are a damn important, and we thank you very much uh, for your awesome contributions to Bitcoin. <laughs> you can make all the mistakes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Rusty Rossell wrote a couple uh, days back that without a concrete taproot proposal, it's hard to make assertions, and that's absolutely right. Right? We we don't even yet have concrete proposals uh, on on st stuff like, for example, taproot. We have, of course, the theory uh, developed by Gregory Maxwell and others, but far from a precise implementation, and definitely uh, no uh, like, like no code uh, up and running. So take this all with a somewhat grain of salt, and we really have a lot of more work to do. I'm going to offer a completely concrete, uh, or, well, I'm not going to offer a completely concrete proposal, uh, but for what it's worth, here are my thoughts on what should be included in SegWit version 1 proposal, which I think might be concrete enough uh, for discussion purposes. And again, right, this is very cutting edge, and uh, we are probably going to see many more changes, but I think it's worth uh, getting to know uh, all this awesome stuff here. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, we are going to introduce a 33-byte version 1 witness address that should encode a sec p 256 k one elliptical curve point or elliptical curve cryptography point that is spendable either uh, by a direct Schnorr signatures, right? So the cool thing with SegWit is that we can quote-unquote, easily upgrade the signature algorithm. Uh, and now we can use a elliptical curve point uh, that, that is your private key and then uh, uh, get the direct signature uh, so that it can spend this uh, on that point so that the small s times g equals the random r times the hash of random r and p and the transaction digest times p. Okay, this is uh, just fancy cryptography uh, that, that explains here how uh, a signature works with Schnorr. And the one-byte SIG hash um, 
per the other thread indicating exactly what goes into this transaction digest. Okay, so uh, what we have here is not the block digest, a great podcast as well, but actually the transaction digest that includes all the important data and that is being signed here. Uh, we also have a script, a locate, lowercase s, uh, the witness data for that script, right? Then thanks to segregated witness, we can separate uh, the witness, the signature, uh, or well, the solution to the script uh, itself with the taproot and Merkle path to the script of the, uh, the uh, P, uh, which is here the elliptical curve point, uh, together with the path of the script and the secret satisfying the taproot conditions. Uh, so again, they, the cool thing is that it can either be here a regular single Schnorr signature, or it can be something else, right? The, the entire script that is hidden away in the taproot proposal, uh, which is really nice. Uh, we also have here the, the next point, the taproot scripts uh, should get a version. And since you have to provide P anyway in order to spend uh, by a script, you have to get, you've got seven bits spare. Uh, so the cool thing is that because Tamproot is rather efficient compared to what we currently have, we can use some extra bits, some extra pieces of data uh, to encode uh, some more awesome stuff. So uh, continuing here, uh, we have seven, sp uh, seven bits spare in the bytes that encode the, uh, the e evenness and oddness or the evenness and oddness of P. Uh, we've read that in the Bitcoin Optag newsletter a couple weeks ago, uh, that because of this even and oddness, uh, you actually have to uh, use seven additional bytes in order to specify this. So uh, because we have Schnorr, now, or, well, hopefully, uh, with this proposal, then we can we no longer have to take care if this is even or odd uh, of P, and thus we have some additional bytes with our bits, which is cool. Almost one byte. Uh, so that gives you uh, version 1.0 uh, to version 1.127 uh, for free, uh, which is awesome. So we can have in total uh, <laughs> all these different versions here, uh, and they will use the exact same or even less uh, space than previously. So that is really cool. Again, it's like we're, we're talking about a couple of bits of efficiency, but that's how, how beautiful the Bitcoin software already is. So if we define script version zero initially and just automatically accept any script with a later version, we can soft fork arbitrary script upgrades without bumping the SegWit major version. So that is really cool, right? So again, with SegWit, we have no versioning. And currently, we're at version zero. And this proposal here is for version 1.0. Uh, and then we can, and of course, one here being the major version. And because we have these seven extra bits uh, that, uh, that we save here, because Schnorr does not need to be di or differentiate between being even and odd of P, then we can get in total 127 sub, uh, let's say, uh, sub versions or, or lower uh, versions that we can easily soft fork or well, actually, no, we, we soft fork once in order to upgrade here version one. And then all of these other 127 bits, or sorry, 127 versions can be included in this one single software, uh, which is awesome. So again, uh, forks in general are always bad and or well, quote unquote bad. They're at least critical. And uh, the, the cool thing is that those soft forks tend to be more secure than hard forks, okay? And especially on the, uh, on the ethical side as well, right? Soft forks are, are voluntary, uh, or some of them are. <laughs> we should replace the elliptical curve digital signature of check sig and check multi sig operations with, schnu with new Schnorr operations. Uh, so right now, right, we have the check sig, uh, which would be uh, you, you write in check sig and then the public key. And then you have to prove that the signature actually corresponds to that public key. Same is, of course, true for here, the check multi sig. Of course, there were several public keys and signatures. However, Schnorr somewhat uh, functions differently and more efficiently, right? That's why it's such a huge upgrade. Uh, but we need to have something else other than check sig and check multi sig. And thus, a new name has been suggested for this op, which is check DLS uh, for a discrete log signature. 
uh, and he is just using this now as a placeholder and maybe uh, this is going to be integrated with check dls uh, in the future, of course, we don't know yet. So a discrete log signature. Uh, so it is going to be a verification of the Schnorr signature um, that we have discussed here uh, with the crazy cryptography up top. Okay, uh, rather than check multisig, a simple, more general approach seems to be check DLS add, which takes a signature, a number, and a pub key and increments the number if the signature is valid and leaves it untouched if not. Okay, so it's so quite a lot in here. So the cool thing is with, uh, with, with Shinori is that we can have uh, this, let's say the, these incremental um, changes to the signature. So uh, we have the signature uh, discussed above and just a random number uh, and then a public key. And if the if the signature corresponds to the public key, then we can add one well, unit on top of this number. Uh, and we can use this little trick in order to build a, a very cool or very efficient way of doing multi-sig. So he gives an example here. Two of three multi-sig uh, would then become a zero, a, the first public key, check DLS add, and if the signature is correct, corresponding to this public key, then it would add one, right? Then we have here the next public key. Again, check DLS add, which is cool. We have the random number here, uh, the, the nonce, right? And then again, check DLS add, and we have two. Uh, so this number two right here uh, would then be the two out of three multi-sig. Uh, so we have three different public keys, right? Uh, however, then only, or, well, sorry, we, uh, this here is the, is the redeem script. So we only need two scripts, uh, uh, two public keys and two signatures, right? Uh, so that is very nice. Uh, that means that replacing the current uh, for check multi-sig and sig verify opcodes with three opcodes. Uh, so we can have, well, we're going to reduce the opcode um, number. We're going to have check the discrete log signature. We're going to have check discrete log signatures verify. And we are going to have check discrete log signature add. And the cool thing is we don't really need uh, to have an uh, explicit multi-sig function because we can use a single signature checks and verifications and increment it with this add opcode which is quite nice. And very cool is here what he explains in the next paragraph, that to make the batch verifica verifiability of signatures work, the only acceptable invalid signature for check DLS or check DLS add needs to be an empty vector. Anything else should fail the script, transaction, and block. Um, so, uh, cool thing with Schnorr is that we can very easily batch the verification of such a large transactions and multi-sigs, which are going to which is going to speed up uh, the verification process tremendously. Uh, so go back a couple of Bitcoin Optech newsletters, and, and we discuss it there. Another thing that might be added uh, to this uh, or to, to the SegWit version would be adding the op mask operator uh, to support script masking. We are sick hash per the other thread. Uh, and of course, it links you to, an, to another thread which we might read in the future. So op mask here is important uh, because we have uh, the sick hash uh, and the, the sick hash that we need here for this, for this signature scheme. So note that this only matters for the new check discrete log signature opcodes. Since for direct signatures on the script public key, there is no script to mask. This means it's completely changeable with new script versions if desired. So that's really cool. We, uh, we want to make sure that the sick hash, so the sick hash is the part of the transaction that is actually put into the hashing function and then signed cryptographically. And there are different sick hash flags. So we could either do sick hash all, what would be, for example, we hash the entire raw data of the of the signature, or sorry, of the transaction, and then sign this, right? Or we could uh, have different types of sick hashes. For example, sick hash no input, right? So that only the outputs are hashed, but not the inputs, uh, and hash and signed. 
Uh, so this is really cool, and especially here again, uh, this this extra upgradability, so to say, with newer script versions than in the future, uh, which is really useful. Again, we we want to still have some some leeway of of changing the script and and upgrading it with new things as they come up. I mean, this is so cutting edge, right? We really want to make sure that we uh, that we have the opportunity of of staying up to date. Uh, so another thing that he wants to add is making almost all the currently invalid opcodes upgradable with what I'm calling op success, uh, semantic zero. Uh, so op success, uh, that would be a great success, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, but basically, there are a bunch of operational codes that Satoshi put into the first version of Bitcoin. And as with anything with this consensus software, uh, they are still there, right? Uh, they are, however, turned off. They are no longer let's say, usable and acceptable, but they are still in the code base. And what Anthony is, is suggesting here is that we can, or that we now do the groundwork so that we can, in the near future, uh, make sure that we uh, can upgrade them easily with something that is useful. And here he suggests op success. So what exactly is this? He also provides a footnote, which we're going to read in just a second. Uh, so that we have more flexibility than the op no op. Uh, gives us. So op no op is the current way of, of invalidating these scripts, or sorry, these opcodes. An approach for those semantics that seem fairly easy to analyze is to treat script processing as going in phases. First, you tokenize, and that's not the shitcoin tokenization. <laughs> so first you tokenize the check push sizes and overall script sizes. Um, so we want to make sure that the script is not too large, right? And that we don't push too much on the stack. If any op success appears, well, simply do success. If a banned op code appears, then fail. Uh, that would be op where if and op not if. And, and he asks here if, if they should be uh, included as well. Otherwise, run the script. Fail if there's an error. And fifth, if there's exactly one non-zero item on the stack, succeed. Otherwise, fail. And uh, he, he has a bunch of cool stuff here. So this is basically how the scripting uh, language works in Bitcoin. It's a stack-based language. So you have the, uh, the, like the, the, the script itself, and then you have a operational stack on which you do all the calculations. And what he is saying is that if on this calculation stack, the op success comes in, abort all the future stuff that, that you would have uh, verified and simply, do, or simply go, okay, succeed. This is valid. Uh, then if, the, if something uh, banned comes, like the old op code, uh, then fail it. Uh, otherwise, also, if there's an error or if there is something else than a single non-zero item, then the script is invalid, right? That would be, for example, if there is a wrong signature, right? It's an it's a invalid script. It's not correct. However, if there is only the non-zero item, then it's a success. And uh, it validates to true. Obviously, an implementation can do these in parallel if, there's, uh, if that's more efficient. Again, right, we really want to tinker out here the most efficiency that we can get. Uh, that way, any of the op success opcodes can be replaced by any normal opcode. For example, addition, different, uh, for example, addition, a different sort of signature check sick, push transactions to the stack or blockchain data on, uh, to the stack. Um, in a soft fork, again, soft forks are usually more preferable than hard forks. And you can easily be sure that the new functionality is a soft fork, as long as you're not trying to change how pushes work. And so the cool thing is here with this op success that it is more easily upgradable and that old clients still assume this valid. Uh, however, the new clients can, can get some, let's say, additional functionality out there. Okay, and uh, first footnote, footnote we're going to uh, read as well. This even means that you could use op success opcodes to signal an upgrade for other opcodes. For example, op arit 64 bit that upgrades op add, etc., to support arithmetic on 64 bit inputs. 
Uh, so basically, we can use op success to signal additional uh, things here uh, that that might be yeah uh, that might be coming to the scripting language specifically, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, let's go down here and read uh, the the footnotes. So there he links to a Bitcoin talk and to a mailing list uh, entry to op return true and op return valid, uh, and he kind of proposes something uh, somewhat similar. Uh, so if, if you'd like, uh, go back and read this here as well. And then the quote-unquote drawbacks to this approach is that it means that you cannot partially verify a script if you think that you know what the first few opcodes mean. So if a script upgrade has happened, but your node has not upgraded, even if you see a transaction in the block with what you think is the public key, op check DLS and op check success, or sorry, op success, you don't check the signature. Uh, so that's really cool. So, so this would happen as follows. You pop uh, the public key here on the stack. Sorry, you, you push the public key on the stack. You push the check DLS on the stack, and then you push the op success on the check, uh, on the stack. And because you then see op success on the stack, you immediately move forward without necessarily checking the signature here. Uh, and thus, even those nodes that do not know what discrete lock signatures are here, which is, of course, the new opcode uh, being introduced via the soft fork, uh, even the old clients are going to proceed uh, and valid, right? Uh, so that is uh, quite an interesting approach here. Okay. And that would be it. Uh, so this would be all the major changes that he would add to, a, to the proposed version one of segregated witness. Um, a couple more uh, version bits, right, uh, that handle here all the signatures. Um, then we have, mm -hmm, yeah, exactly here, that we have the 127, quote-unquote, for free uh, versions that we can use uh, here in Taproom. Uh, the different, or moving away from check sig and check multi-sig to check discrete log signatures right here. And the op mask, which we need in order to mask the script public key uh, of the Schnorr signatures. And then here a way of doing, uh, of using op success in order to uh, make sure that we can easily, up, uh, quote unquote, easily upgrade the scripting language in a soft fork so that old clients can still uh, see w what is going on and still verify everything. Okay. Uh, so this is a modest collection of changes, but already quite a lot. <laughs> so we have different uh, signature and address stuff would be, of course, here, Schnorr signature, major, major upgrade, a new SIGHash versioning, uh, which, of course, includes SIGHash no input, which I mentioned previously, which is vitally important uh, for the latest version of the Lightning Network updating mechanism called L2 which is actually Satoshi's truest vision, a building on top of the sequence numbers that he introduced back in 2009 or 10. <clears throat> Taproot, which is outstanding and really, really important. I mean, Taproot is a special kind of magic that only works with Schnorr signatures, so we can really build on top of that. We also have the Merkleized scripts. Uh, so this is something that used to be called Merkleized abstract syntax trees, but there are actually no syntaxes in there. Uh, so right now it's only called Merkleized scripts. Um, basically, it's, uh, it's somewhat similar here to Taproot. Uh, Taproot builds on Merkleized scripts, uh, and it's, it's a very useful, uh, useful function of introducing even more advanced and complex scripts to Bitcoin. Uh, we can also avoid weird check multi-sig behavior, right, with the new check discrete log signature, which is really cool. And we are, uh, we help with upgradability. So we have these script minor versions, which we then no longer have to do soft forks in, in order to get into the protocol. We only have to do a new soft fork for every major version. And we have this op success to specifically help with upgrading the, the scripting language which is great. Okay, I think there is a good reason to bundle all of those together. The signature stuff goes together with the new address versioning. Awesome. And the upgradability stuff helps to reduce the need to do more new address versions. Uh, and, and that's right, right? Uh, because we can have, or because we have this upgradability, and especially here, these minor versions, we no longer have to do 
all that many massive changes to get new stuff into the protocol, which is useful. Um, yeah. Well, it's modest at least compared to, to what's conceivable. Oh, yeah, there would be a bunch of more stuff uh, possible. But, well, let's, let's uh, slow it down and actually build something that lasts. Let's not move fast and break things. Let's move slowly and make sure that it does not break. I would much prefer that. There are lots of other neat ideas that could theoretically be done in the same soft fork. Uh, but in my humble opinion, they are better left for later. For example, graft root, G root, cross input signature aggregation. Uh, and graft root is, uh, I always mix these two up. Uh, one is more advanced, more, uh, more let's say, more, more flexible and more usable. Uh, either graft root or tap root. Uh, both come from the, from the th incredible mind of Gregory Maxwell. Uh, but uh, I actually do believe that Taproot is the more uh, current version. Uh, so I'm not sure why we would uh, add Graphroot in the second version here. But again, not exactly sure here. Non-interactive have signature aggregation. Uh, no clue exactly what this is, uh, but the cool thing with non-interactive protocols is that uh, Alice and Bob do not need to communicate in order to perform the signature computation. Uh, and thus, it's very useful, especially for the blockchain, right? Because if we have uh, things here on the blockchain, we, we don't want the nodes to be rely to necessarily have to communicate with each other when they do the verification. Um, because otherwise, well, if you do your initial block download, for example, and verification, uh, then that would be uh, not optimal. Uh, so half signatures uh, sounds like magic. I'm not sure exactly how, how that works, but aggregation means uh, that we can, uh, let's say we have 10 different peers and each of them has a, a private and public key and each of them does a signature. But because of Schnorr, we can aggregate all the public keys into one public key that looks like any other public key. Uh, but the public key can only have a valid signature when each of the individual private keys does a signature. And then all these individual signatures can be aggregated and combined to be only one signature that looks like any other signature. Uh, so that is really, really cool. And key aggregation and signature aggregation is a huge benefit of having, uh, of having Schnorr. We could also re-enable some opcodes that might be useful, like cat, mul, xor, and some others. Um, no clue exactly what this means, but I guess uh, cats are always nice. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that, uh, <laughs> that uh, on the internet, no one knows that you're a cat and no one knows that you're a dog. But if we maybe have an opcode, then that, that might be provable. Well, <laughs> and if it's on the blockchain, then it must be correct. <laughs> Uh, we have check sick of msg on stack uh, so we can check a signature of a message on the stack again no clue exactly what that means uh, we have also here push transaction data or other convenient uh, covenant e things uh, so this basically uh, means that there are some some yeah more some additional uh, requirements that need to be fulfilled before the Bitcoin, the UTXO can be spent again. Again, this sounds like magic to me, so I'm not quite sure exactly how it works. Different crypto systems. Oh, that, that is very interesting, right? Currently, Bitcoin uses the Lipsec P256K1 um, curve, elliptical curve, elliptical signature, elliptical, oh, ECDSA, elliptical curve digital signatures. Uh, and that can be changed, right? So Schnorr signature is a different crypto. And right here we have uh, 384 bit curves uh, for better protection against future quantum computing advances, uh, conceivably pairing curves. Uh, so again, there are many different signatures out there and many different cryptography uh, types out there. Uh, and as of right now, even with ECDSA, uh, we are quantum resistant at least in the early days, right? Uh, of course, there is, uh, th there's always going to be advances in both uh, defense of these elliptical or of these uh, crypto systems as well as attacks. Uh, so we need to stay vigilant and we need to stay on the utmost cutting edge here um, on making sure that we are well protected against a leaking of the private key. Uh, so basically quantum computing 
has the or it has the problem that, uh, for example, with elliptical curves, you can uh, when you only have the public key. Uh, and you have quantum compute, uh, a very good quantum computer, which we're probably far off, then you can compute the private key. Uh, so that is, of course, not optimal. If all and similar language features, again, uh, sorry, no clue what this means. This is all very much magic to me as much as it is to you. <laughs> as Okay, um, he continues, as far as how those things could get done in the in future, this collection of features leaves four ways to make future improvements. We can, of course, do a new SegBit version, and that would be a major version here from version 2 till version 16. Uh, and again, right, we have the minor versions, which we talked about earlier. Uh, where can I find it? Right here. Uh, so we can do a lot of stuff uh, sticking to the main first version of segregated witness, but we have space for up to version 16, which is quite nice. And this would be needed for graft root or signature aggregations and different signature systems. Um, and I'm actually not certain what would happen if we have here version 60 or if we go beyond version 16, um, because that would probably require some additional bytes and most likely another soft fork to increase the versioning fields here. Uh, in this. So I'm not exactly certain what would happen here, but it's uh, very interesting. We could also have a different length in segregated witness version one public keys. Uh, this could be used to provide a hash instead of the actual taproot point or use a larger elliptical curve, elliptical curve cryptography. Curve. I think there are uh, too many curves in here. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, again here, taproot is, is a really, really useful and it would be nice if uh, we can hash this in order then to uh, to, yeah, to save some additional spaces and probably also preserve on some privacy if we hash the taproot point. It might no longer be clear that it is actually taproot uh, and that might help with privacy, at least until the script is being spent. Uh, though this is more speculation on my part, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, we can also add new segregated witness version one script versions. Uh, that would be here the minor versions, which we talked about earlier. And this is needed for big redesigns and simplifications of the script. We can, of course, also add some additional opcodes, which would replace the op success. And uh, as far as I know, op success is not yet in the not yet in the uh, protocol. So this here might be a, yeah, a, f a future thoughts on how we can get it out again and replace it with something that might be better. Uh, this can be used to re-enable disabled opcodes like mul, cat, xor, etc. And it can be used to add more complicated things like check stack discrete log signature or push transaction data. And this can be used to try out different signature schemes. Um, he continues then, I think it's worth noting that op success upgrades could be developed and deployed in parallel, since you just need to choose an opcode to take over and presumably a version bit to signal when the new behavior gets activated. The other methods require uh, agreeing on everything that's going on in the new version, uh, which need a bit more coordination. Uh, so the cool thing here with, with op success that Anthony is proposing is that it's much easier to upgrade and that you no longer need to have uh, global consensus or like network consensus overall in order to add just a little minor change. Uh, all you need to do is you need uh, to declare a old op code to do something new and then some signalization. Signalation, is that a word? <laughs> Some signaling uh, that you now use this opcode to do something else. Uh, so op success here will help with making sure that we have a more upgradable and usable way of using Bitcoin. So we have the number two footnote here. One thing that could be feasible is to have some simple op success upbreaks, like enabling CAD, XOR, etc., or add, adding check stack discrete log signature, uh, spec'd, implemented, and tested, and have them activated at the same time 
a schnorr and taproot, etc., while keeping them an independent feature at the BIP and con uh, concept and implementation level. Uh, so basically, we could throw this all together within the same soft fork. However, we would still separate things out so that uh, here these new uh, upgrades are not uh, put together with the major Schnorr and Taproot upgrades. So that would be useful in a sense that we would get these features into the protocol sooner uh, and we can still uh, separate the different uh, things and especially here the major upgrades from Schnorr and Taproot and it's probably best to keep them separated here on a, a implementation level, right? Uh, let's not do too much at once. The idea here is that if it turns out that they're not ready in time, Schnorr, Taproot, etc., don't need to get delayed. And the others can just be enabled when they are ready, later using a separate version bit. I'm not sure if there's anyone who's interested in shepherding and doing the spec implementation for any of the more straightforward features like that. Uh, so uh, that, that's really useful, right? When, when having these things separated, uh, we can implement them at different speeds. And, and that is quite useful and, of course, helps with the overall speed of, of getting new stuff into this. However, uh, as, as with everything, uh, someone needs to do it, right? And we, we need a bunch more help uh, from everyone. Uh, so if you can implement, if you can uh, do the spec, if you are one of these wizards, uh, thank you very much for doing it. And thank you much for helping out. Uh, really useful. Okay. Uh, anyway, to get back to the intro sentence and to give an example of how I think version 1 addresses will work, here's my take on L2 in a taproot world. Uh, so... Okay, this is, of course, uh, code and, and Bitcoin script. So I, I might butcher this because that's definitely not my forte. Uh, but, but stick with me. This is actually really, really interesting and compelling. And I'm sorry in advance for all the many mistakes that I will make. <clears throat> so uh, basically what he's saying here is that when we have a segregated witness, uh, then we can do taproot, uh, which will help with, uh, with hiding some of the complexity of scripts. And thus, we can increase the complexity and the size of scripts without necessarily burdening the blockchain and, and other full nodes to save all this. Uh, and of course, L2 here is a, a major upgrade to Lightning Network update uh, payment channels uh, that require the SIGHASH no input function. Uh, so I think it's, it's worth it going through this uh, and, and trying to make sense of it. First, uh, we have a, a funding transaction, right? We have an update transaction, and then we have a settlement transaction uh, with, uh, upon others, the cooperative close. Uh, so let's, let's get through it one by one. First, we need to fund uh, the transaction. So you need to have an input, which can be whatever, right? It's going to be your single signature, uh, regular cold storage on the cold card or on your mobile. It can be multi-sig or whatever. It doesn't matter. Somehow you need to provide enough Bitcoin uh, to put into the Lightning Network, right? Uh, so this will be the input of the funding transaction. That's the boring part. Uh, the output, that is what is actually going to be interesting. Uh, so we are going to pay uh, to the Q, P plus the hash of P and S. So uh, P is the public key, S is the script, and G, the generator point. Uh, where P being uh, right here the public key, a music, so that is a key aggregation um, of Schnorr, uh, of, or well, the multi sig implementation of Schnorr that way, uh, of both A and B. So the public key right here, which is again of Schnorr key aggregation, only one public key and only one signature uh, that uh, kind of cloaks two individual private public keys of both Alice and Bob. Uh, so that quite nice, right? And then the script that we also have is uh, the mask of 500 uh, million check lock time verify. Uh, so 500 million uh, check lock time. I think check lock time relies on the, the Unix time. Uh, so this is actually seconds uh, that we need for check lock time. Uh, and this uh, this is in so that the script can only be or is only valid after a certain time has passed and 
again, right, that's the that's a little time frame that you need to quote unquote freeze your your Bitcoin in the script so the Lightning Network works. Uh, then we have the public key, right, which is here the multi-sig. And we check the discrete log signature and verify it. Uh, so we check if here the public key and the signature is actually correct. Uh, and of course, if the check lock time has passed. So if there has been sufficient time uh, moved on. And this is what we put into the funding transaction. Now, how can we actually do Lightning Network payments? And that is, of course, uh, the update uh, of the transaction itself. So this is going to be uh, a, new com a new commitment transaction. We have, of course, the unlock time of 500 million, so the time that we choose up here, plus some arbitrary value here uh, that, that depends on the current case. Uh, and, and that is assumed. The input of this update transaction is, of course, the uh, funding transaction right here. So this entire script, we're going to spend it. Uh, and Oh, yeah, and by the way, this is here. The funding is nestled in the blockchain with a lot of accumulated proof of work. So we're going to spend this transaction, right? Uh, or we're going to update uh, the tr uh, transaction M if M is smaller than N. Uh, so here, this is in, in regards of, of the time aspect. Uh, the witness here is the public key, right, of this MUSIC, multi-signature in Schnorr, and the script uh, that we've dedicated right here, uh, either this one up here or the one uh, that we've then upgraded already. But let's assume this is the first uh, time we do a update transaction, then it would only be M. We also have uh, the signature then of P, the SIGHASH in script mask, of then the entire script that we've dedicated up here, okay? And this will be the input. Uh, of course, here with the witness proving that we are actually the peers controlling the script. The output uh, would then be a pay to the QN, uh, which is the same as up here. However, with the nth update, uh, so here we, it's not no longer the first update, but actually then the second update, so to say. Uh, and the script would be here, again, same as this one. However, with this, the n plus once, well, n, the n plus the next uh, update. Uh, and this would be the output, right? So we are going to, uh, to spend, so to say, this input script. However, we're not going to publish this to the blockchain just yet. Uh, that we are actually going to do with the settlement transaction. Uh, and here we have inputs, uh, which would be the update transaction N, which we've done up here, uh, with the witness of the signature as we uh, have here with uh, QN and then the sig hash in the script public key with the sequence of the check sequence verify delay. Uh, so again here, we're, we're going to have to wait for a couple blocks until this update transaction has been nestled in the blockchain. And, and in that sense, the counterparty uh, can, yeah, can defend himself. Uh, so, and the outputs of this settlement transaction would be pay A's balance to A. Uh, so that which is on Alice's side of the payment channel, she gets on her own single signature. And of course, pay Bob's balance to B. So that is also, of course, important that Bob gets whatever he has still left in his channel. And then the third till the end step would be the hash time lock contract, paying to Bob uh, whatever is here down below with the cooperative close. So here for the cooperative close, we have the funding transaction, uh, again, of the SIG hash in all and out all. Uh, so we're going to hash all the inputs and outputs of this transaction and sign it. And the outputs uh, would be as agreed. So whatever we have here, uh, the current channel of Alice and Bob. So I hope I, I didn't butcher all this and I hope I didn't to make too many mistakes. Again, I, not at all a developer, I'm really struggling with this as well. But accumulating this information and trying to understand it is always the first step. So it's so good that you're sticking here with me through this. Uh, 
He is also assuming you create update transaction zero and settlement transaction zero to pay yourself back if the setup fails prior to publishing the funding transaction. The L2 paper has a trigger phase for that purpose instead. Also, these two transactions don't actually need to use no input because they directly spend from the funding transaction. And uh, that is correct. L2 is only needed here when we, uh, when we have already done some updates. And that was not the case here in, in this example. As far as the hash time lock contract outputs go, for SHA-256 pre-images, you prepare a tab root address, uh, which is right here, uh, the, the Schnorr tab root address, where the script hash is the Merkle root for the tree of two scripts. The time of check lock time verify, and then a check, so the, uh, a is public key, with check the discrete lock signature verify and the hash 160 uh, of equal and Bob's check discrete log signature verify. For the sec 256 K1 pre-image, your address is P prime of the music of this entire. So we're gonna have here the multi-sig of Alice, Bob, and this uh, nonce times the generator point. For some value n that just ensures that you have different keys for each hash time locked contract. So we want to make sure to not reuse keys, right? That is uh, both a privacy and a security uh, concern here. And you prepare two pre signed transactions spending the settlement output. Uh, so whose transaction ID is yet unknown. Right? So we don't yet have the, the, the entire transaction signed and in the blockchain, and thus the transaction ID of the settlement transaction uh, is yet unknown. Thus, we cannot refer to it in a way that uh, we can trust that it is going to be included just as this. So both the signed with SIG hash and a partial signature from B and the end lock time set to the timeout so that Alice can complete the signature and claim after the timeout. The other pays Bob and has a conditional partial signature from Alice, which Bob can complete upon finding out the pre-image. Uh, so that's cool here. Bob can only, uh, or well, when Alice provides here Bob with the partial signature, that is not yet enough for Bob to, to have a valid transaction. Although he can, as soon as Alice re releases the pre-image, then he can actually use this to settle, which is quite nice. And then here, the settlement of the pre-signed hash time lock contact, hash time lock contract spend transaction all make use of the no input commit to script pub key variant in this agreement arrangement. Uh, so it does seem like it's probably useful in practice. Scriptless scripts make the direct signature path pretty useful. Um, yeah, so this was it. Uh, this is here a, a great summary uh, by Anthony Towns on how to, how to make sure that the SegWit version one uh, is actually uh, quite beautiful. And I think he has something here. Uh, of course, it's, it's not yet perfect. We still have a lot to do. Uh, and we're not claiming that I understood half of this. Uh, but it's a really important step in the right direction. And this was written right a couple months ago already, uh, and there have been a lot of improvements. But I think it was really useful, and I've definitely learned quite a lot here in the sense that uh, because we have done our homework and have implemented segregated witness in a way uh, that we have these uh, version fields and also now thinking that how we can even further expand this with something like op success we can really make sure that we achieve a lot of upgradability in this protocol which is very very useful uh, so thank you very much here to anthony towns for providing this thorough thorough research uh, or, or well, write-up uh, of this entire way of how we can get Schnorr and Tabroot actually upgraded into the software. And 
although this sounds really advanced already, there is still a lot of work to do. And of course, the implementation is still yet uh, to be written and the code to be tested. And so this is still going to take uh, quite a couple of time or uh, quite a lot of time uh, before we actually have this implemented and up and running. But we have the brightest minds in Bitcoin working on it. And that's definitely reassuring. So uh, please, peers, let me know how you like this. I think the, the Bitcoin death mailing list and the lightning death mailing list has every now and then a treasures uh, of invaluable knowledge that is really worth accumulating. And I am personally still very much struggling to understand this all. Uh, and however, right, teaching this actually helps me a lot. Uh, so with me going here step by step through these emails, and kind of explaining as I go, it really helps my understanding. And of course, I'm going to make a thousand and one mistakes. So please, please, please never trust me here and always verify for yourself. And if you realize that I've messed up, please let me know because well, otherwise I wouldn't have told you. So I really want to discover the truth here and really want to make sure that what I'm telling you is correct. So uh, please be active as always in the chats and, and in the comments. And let's make sure that we all together uh, more and more understand this fascinating uh, subject of Bitcoin. Thank you very much and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.